Let me read for us James 2, verses 1 through 9. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down on my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. On the 4th of July this past week, I went to Mount Vernon with my family and with some uh, <coughs> friends, families. Uh, we, um, what better place to spend the 4th of July than in our nation's house, is what the sign says there. George Washington's own abode. <laughs> we went there and attended a... Uh, naturalization ceremony, a citizenship ceremony, where there were a whole bunch of uh, immigrants being sworn in as citizens on July 4th at Mount Vernon. It was pretty cool. In fact, they were sworn in by none other than George Washington himself <laughs> in costume and speaking in the first person and everything. Like I'm fresh, fresh back from fighting the Indians and the, and the, the evil British and, and we have emerged victorious and I usher you to join us in our, our wonderful journey as a nation. It was a pretty cool speech as far as those kind of things go. Um, we played a little game together. Uh, uh, not me and the people, me and my friends played a little game together. When you hear the name, we would try to guess what the nationality was behind that name bef five seconds earlier before this. this and, uh, I think I was pretty good at it because I know soccer. And so a lot of the names, you know, like Fahagini, I was like, Iranian. They're like, how do you know? There's an Iranian soccer player. I mean, <laughs> just my world, sorry. <laughs> After that, we went back to my house where we had a, a barbecue, uh, smoked pork, like God meant our country to operate on the 4th of July. We had all kinds of American flags around our yard and red, white, and blue, uh, you know, tassels on the stairs and everything. It was, a, it was a patriotic festival at my place. You know, as people were getting out of the citizenship ceremony, you walk outside and right there, you're confronted with on the sidewalk outside of Mount Vernon, uh, a register to vote table. So you get sworn in, you walk out and you register to vote right there. Now, there's not classes of citizenship in the United States. Every citizen that got sworn in on July 4th at 11.32 in the morning has the same rights as a citizen that I do, born in the United States and everything. Albuquerque, New Mexico counts as the United States. <laughs> Founded 100 years before Plymouth Rock, but you know, that's for later. There's not degrees of American citizenship. The people who are sworn in and register at the same table to vote as a family that has American flags all over their house and celebrates the 4th of July with smoked pork. Or as a family that has, you know, the two families I was with, both of the dads have served tours in Afghanistan with the Marines and the Army. That doesn't get them extra citizenship points. When they go to vote, there's not one table for those that have done a, a tour in Afghanistan, another table for those born in New Mexico, and another table for those who took the oath of citizenship five minutes ago. And if you did award different degrees of citizenship, certainly getting sworn in by George Washington has to be worth some kind of extra credit. <laughs> Somewhere. <coughs> but it's a basic principle that the moment you're a citizen, you have all of the rights. You can go get a firearm if that's still allowed today. You could go do that. <laughs> you can vote. You can, all the rights and prerogatives of being a citizen, all the freedoms that come with citizenship, they have access to immediately. Our secular country understands that point. Our secular culture gets that there are not degrees of citizenship. Yet so often in the church, we entertain this idea that some people's professions of faith or some people's conversions are worth more than others. 
We embrace the idea that, oh, we think, oh, if this, if this guy who's a senator, if he gets saved, how awesome would that be in the kingdom of God versus if this guy, he, if he's a janitor, well, whatever. Unless, is he a janitor in the Oval Office? Oh, that's pretty good. Come sit down up front. <laughs> and this verse here is about particularly exposing the folly of classifying people, dividing people based on external superficial characteristics. In the verse, my brothers, is how it begins. That phrase, the Delphoi, brothers and sisters, it's uh, uh, to talk to people in the church. It doesn't mean people outside the church. It's a phrase that's used in James repeatedly to talk to those who are in the church. My brothers and sisters in Christ is the idea. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That word, show no partiality, it's one word in the Greek. It means don't receive the face. That's how you could literally translate it. Don't raise up somebody's face. It's from an Old Testament concept in the book of uh, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy chapter 10. It's translated into to Greek, the Septuagint. And as far as receiving the face, it's the idea of a judge who's sitting at the city gate, who's hearing a dispute. Uh, Moses commands the judges to see past the face to the facts. A judge, of course, especially in smaller Israelite communities, would be tempted to rule for the family that is more powerful or rule for the family that has uh, more of a strategic position, perhaps in line for uh, uh, sharing family wealth because in Israel the land is passed down to the families. And in a smaller town, though, those things are connected. And so the command that Moses gives judges is don't decide a case based on how you know the person or definitely based on what they what they look like, their appearance. Are they an alien? Are they an immigrant? Or are they an Israelite? That can't be a factor in how you weigh the case. That's the Old Testament command. Now, this passage is not condemning people for having friends that, you know, are, are their age or kids. You know, uh, my kids have, uh, are friends with other families that have kids that age. You know, that's, that's not what this is condemning. This passage is rebuking the desire in the human heart to classify people's value and worth and legal standing and even privileges in the church based upon external characteristics. Or just make it shorter, this passage condemns people for judging others based upon things that don't matter to God. The hard attitude, it says, I'm going to assign you certain legal rights or I'm going to assign you certain privileges in the church or I'm going to assign you a certain value or worth in my own heart or in my own estimation of you based upon external superficial characteristics. That's why by the time of the New Testament, this word means just don't receive the face. You know, stereotypes serve a, a function. We make stereotypes about people because they save time. It would take a lot of work to get to know an individual and at least a conversation to get to know uh, how they were raised and where they're from and, you know, those kind of things. And to make an actual assessment of that person's character would take you getting to know them. And so that's a lot of, of work. It's so much easier to take something superficial and external, it takes you one second to see it and recognize it and make a judgment based upon those things. That's why people stereotype. It's just a time saver. But it's also wrong. It's also sinful, especially if you think your stereotype is true. Because you begin attributing characteristics to someone based upon things that do not matter at all. The exegetical, evangelical exegetical commentary says this, quote, James is effectively declaring that one cannot hold to the faith of Jesus while at the same time practicing social discrimination. You see this in terms of saying, oh, this person's politically influential, so they have more value to the church than that person who's not. Or if I was in Los Angeles, I would say by receiving, oh, this person has more access in Hollywood or is in bigger budget films or is a higher IMBD rating than this person, so this person's more valuable. International movie, internet movie database, by the way. <laughs> I was asked that first hour. Wealth, this person's wealthy. They have more money than me and so they should have more access to church or to the leadership of the church or more opportunities to teach and serve in the church because they have deeper pocketbooks or they drive nicer cars or have a nicer house or houses or what have you. And we think through American culture, I mean, what is the obvious application of this? It's our besetting sin in our country of racism. 
The sin of racism is a poison that's injected in the past and it courses through the veins of a culture and it's passed on, it's transmuted from one generation to the next until it becomes so entrenched in a society it's often difficult to recognize it. Like fish in the the pond, you don't realize you're wet, so it is often with Americans and racism. Some sins attack yourself. Some sins attack others. And some sins attack God. Sin of racism brings together all three of those. It corrodes your own worldview, debases yourself. It's an attack on the inherent value and dignity of someone else. And of course, it's an ultimately an attack on God as it takes on the historicity of Genesis, denies the literal Adam, denies the literal flood, and denies our unity in Jesus Christ as well. We'll talk more about that later. The conclusion of this kind of racial discrimination is seen down in verse 9. If you show partiality, that's the same word. If you categorize people by external superficial characteristics like race, like income, you are committing sin, James says. And you are convicted by the law. There's not a lot of wiggle room here. There's not a lot of justifications. There's, there's no room for you to say, oh yeah, but sometimes racially uh, stereotyping or racially categorizing people actually is helpful and is true. No, James says, if you do that, you are sinning, period. Well, not quite period. If you're sinning and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. This goes against the nature of God. God doesn't judge this way. Deuteronomy 117, you shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man for judgment is God, is of God's. A person who holds on to favoritism and racism demonstrates that they don't understand what matters to God. This is a sin as old as time. People have always categorized other people in relationship to themselves, make distinguishing uh, characteristics and traits where there are none. So James's appeal to you is to do not practice that while calling yourself a Christian. Verse one, show no partiality, or some translations say no, show no favoritism, but favoritism is almost a kind of a superficial translation itself, isn't it? Like, you know, don't give someone two scoops of ice cream kind of favoritism. That's what I think when I think of that. He's not talking about that though. He's not talking about ice cream here. He's not talking about just personal favoritism. He's talking about this kind of partiality, this kind of categorizing, distinguishing, making judgments about people based upon what mask they're wearing. And that's very familiar in the Greek world. They had this idea of actors with masks. And so it's this idea that the judge would receive a case and take off the person's mask, leave the person in the facts over here, look at their mask and make a statement about that. And so James says, don't even wear the mask of discrimination while you're wearing the mask of Christ. You cannot have both at the same time. You cannot practice discrimination or racism or partiality while calling yourself a Christian or specifically while holding on to the faith. You can't fit both. You can't fit racism and Christian faith in your hands at the same time. You've got to set down one to pick up the other. You can't hold them both simultaneously. And the solution here is not to become a juggler. (laughs) The solution here is to recognize those sins in your church and in your heart. Now, I know, I'm not naive, that uh, I, I know that there are people that hold on to racial distinctions in their mind or cultural distinctions in their minds, that they actually feel that uh, a person's income represents their, their value before society and their value before God, or that a person's race represents certain uh, characteristics that represent their moral quality or ability, and I don't think I'll... 35-minute sermon is going to persuade you otherwise. So I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to give you six reasons that you're not very good at judging other people. I'm just going to operate under the assumption that you're going to leave here and you're going to keep making judgments about other people. So I'm going to try to persuade you. Instead of persuading you to stop it, I at least want to persuade you that you're not very good at it. (laughs) You're not a good judge of other people. The way you categorize other people is going to be wrong and and it's going to be offensive to God, of course, but I'm going to give you six reasons why you're not very good at it. Before I give you the first reason, 
Let me give you the illustration James comes up with in James 2. He's going to come up with a different illustration later on in James 2. Uh, we'll look at that in a couple weeks. But understand what James is doing here is he's inventing two hypothetical scenarios that are so over the top. <laughs> they're designed to make a point. He's not saying this actually happens. He's, he's giving you, it's very similar to some of Jesus' parables. He's inventing a story that is so extreme, it's supposed to shock you and then give you a lesson in light of that. What it's interesting about both of these scenarios in James, both of these extreme hypotheticals he invents, is that even though they're so extreme, you couldn't come up with a more extreme example of it, they still happen. Here's this first one that we'll look at today. We'll look at the other one in a couple of weeks. For if a man, verse 2, wearing a gold ring, and literally it's gold rings, he has lots of rings on his hand, and uh, scholars tell us that in the Roman Empire you could even rent rings, and we rent tuxedos as Americans, they could rent gold rings because it, you know, it's, your, it's how you show off your power and your wealth. So here's a guy with lots of gold rings on his finger. I mean, this is a powerful dude. Picture LeBron James walking in. <laughs> He's actually won championships, right? Is that true? Okay, Just not, don't follow basketball. I'm more of a soccer guy. We covered that er- earlier. Here comes LeBron James, gold rings everywhere. He's big. He's dressed to the, to the nines. He's sharp and he's powerful. and He's got all kinds of gold rings. And you see him walk through the door. And what goes through your heart is, man, how cool would be, it be if he got saved? You know, he had a John 3.16 tattooed on his back and you'd see it when he dunks over his opponents. I mean, how cool would it be if somebody like that got saved? All the gold rings and all the power or to make it more DC-ish, you know, a senator walks in or a Supreme Court justice and you're like, oh, stop the presses. How cool is it that he's here? I mean, how, how powerful that person is. How amazing would it be if that person got saved? And so what do you do? Well, we'll see that in a second. But right behind him walks in somebody different. A poor man in shabby clothing. And literally, it's a one-robed man. He only owns one piece of clothes. One robe. That's all he's got. The idea is that he slept in it last night, probably on the streets. It smells. He didn't wash it because he's got one robe. So it smells. He's poor. He's repulsive. He walks in also at the same time. If you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing with all the gold rings and you say, why don't you sit here in a good place? And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, sit down on my feet. And the image here in the Jewish synagogues is they they would have bleacher seating and the bleachers would face the middle and the, the pulpit or where the person speaks from would be at one end and there would be the leaders of the synagogue would be behind the speaker. And so it'd be kind of like this worship center with the pulpit and then there'd be chairs behind me and then there would be bleachers here and the bleachers would face the middle with an aisle down the middle and all the bleachers face each other. That's the way most of the synagogues were designed. They didn't have seats except on the stage. The synagogues, so you would sit down like bleacher seating like you do in the gym. And so what happens is the powerful guy walks in with his gold rings and you know, the usher jumps up to seat him and walks in right down the middle. And the usher's probably thinking, you know, how cool is it that everybody sees me walking in this, you know, LeBron James. I'm the one who maybe I'll even sit next to him and they'll think I'm with him. And how cool it is that he's here. And they walk him down and they sit him at the front or maybe they sit him on the stage even. Almost showing him off. And meanwhile, the other guy, the one robed fella, <laughs> he walks in and nobody pays attention to him. And it's not that they're making him sit in the back. I mean, it's, this is not so much a distinction of sitting in the front versus sitting in the back. The distinction here is taking great concern to show off the one guy. But the other guy, you don't care where he said. Look what they say. Oh, you stand over there. Why don't you sit down on my feet? Some translations say under my footstool. Well, a footstool is a weird translation. It's not that there's a footstool. It's that there's bleacher seating, remember? So you're saying you can sit behind me. You can sit next to me. You can sit in front of me. Like I'll move my feet, I guess. I'll, you, know, you know how that is in bleachers. Like I think of some events, like you sit down and you put your feet on the bleachers in front of you and it gets crowded and you're like, oh, I have to move my feet so somebody can sit next to me. I mean, that's what this person is saying here. Like I'll move my feet. You can sit on the bleachers in front of me. That's fine. Sit here. But the point is I don't care where you sit. Sit behind me, sit at my feet, I'll even move them, but just sit now, okay, because you're standing up and it's distracting. The guy with all the rings, I'm fine with him standing up. He can pray down the center aisle for all I care. But you, out of my way, wherever you're going to sit, sit quick, okay, and be done with this. You're not throwing the guy out, like possibly could have happened in synagogues. 
you know, these are Christians after all. You're welcome to come in. <laughs> but just sit down and do it quick, okay? That's the scenario. Now, it is somewhat extreme. I mean, it's hard to make this more extreme, is it? <laughs> and yet it's so fascinating how often this gets flagrantly violated. You know, where a politician does come and he gets paraded down the center aisle. Spotlight on him. And I th- went through on a church of a, a tour of a friend's church in Alexandria recently and they have a balcony at it and he was telling me they built their balcony solely so that, that black people would sit in the balcony and not have them on the floor with white people worshiping. This is just down the street. The building's about 100 years old. And he said, by the way, when they built that 100 years ago, they were considered the progressive church because they at least allowed black people in. Most of the other churches in Alexandria didn't allow black people in. They could go to the the black church, but not a white church. His church was so progressive because they had white people on one floor and allowed black people on the other floor. Man, how ahead of their times they were. That was kind of their attitude at the time. So even though this is hypothetical and to the extreme, it's very easy to see how it is actually played out in real life. Wealthy people, I'll sit towards the front. Can I get you a new visitor packet? You look like you have money. Let me tell you, it's four ways to give. Have I told you about our church app? What a difference. Now the sin here, be very clear, the sin that James is addressing is not dressing nicely at church. You can dress nicely at church. It's fine. It's fun to dress nicely at church. Put on your best clothes, come to church. The sin that he's attacking is not dressing poorly at church. He's not saying if you don't dress up, you're in the wrong. It's nothing to, the sin here is not in the rich guy or the poor guy at all. These guys might not even be believers. Commentaries argue about, are they believers? Are they visitors? Maybe they're new converts. He's making this up, okay? (laughs) It doesn't matter. The point is not the two dudes. The point is the hearts of everybody sitting in the seats around the two dudes who are making distinctions in their mind about them based upon how they look. And so James is going to argue with you and he's going to try to persuade you that there are six ways you don't even do this right. Six reasons you're not a good judge of others. First, you're not a good judge because you aren't any different than the people you're judging. You're not a good judge because you're not even any different than them. In this example here, you have the very wealthy person and the very poor person. James's point is that the difference between those two is negligible before God. And you are in the middle judging, looking up to this person, looking down to that person. I mean, do you get it into your head that you are just like they are? You're just like the poor person. You're just like the rich person. You're all persons. <laughs> That's what he means in verse, uh, verse four. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves? And there's a negative tone to that. Don't make distinctions between people in your minds like that based upon superficial characteristics. I mean, obviously there's distinctions among people. Uh, LeBron James can dunk and I can't. I mean, that's, it's not sinful to recognize that. I'm not allowed to lead worship at this church. It's, I just don't have that ability. <laughs> It's not sinful to recognize that. The sin comes when you are distinguishing between people's character or, or value or legal standing or what kind of person they are even based upon those external superficial characteristics. And James says, don't do it because you're all the same. I mean, you go to a pet store and you look in the tank of goldfish, they're a dime a dozen it seems like. Get a net of goldfish for a quarter kind of thing. And you look carefully at the goldfish and some are yellow and some are orange and some are white and some are speckled and how silly it would be for the goldfish to try to segregate themselves. Like, well, I'm a speckled goldfish. I won't swim in the same water as the yellow goldfish. You're in a tank, okay? You're all goldfish. You all cost a dime a dozen. But that's how people are. They begin to categorize themselves thinking that it actual rep- rep- represents an actual difference. People are basically the same as one another. I had a professor in college, a biology professor, Dr. Susan Chavez Cameron at the University of New Mexico, and she wrote in a book, she wrote about this, quote, basically any two humans have 99.8% genetic similarities. Only about 0.2% is different from one human to another. But understand that those differences do not increase by race. In fact, what we might call racial differences, hair, skin, nose, etc., even throw in eyes and facial features, comma, that only gets you to about 0.01%. And she writes this. 
there is actually more genetic variation within a racial group than there is with those outside of a racial group. I preached a whole sermon on the, what I call the myth of race. And I would encourage you to listen to it if you're interested in this topic. It's on the church website under Genesis 9. If you look up Genesis 9, there's a sermon there. I preached in this. I, I don't want to re-preach it now. I do want to re-preach it now, but I resist the temptation. Except to say, you know, obviously our country's besetting sin is this issue. And James's point is that, listen, there's no differences between you. There isn't. Your skin pigment doesn't affect who you are. Are. It affects the way you experience the world, obviously, because people outside you respond differently. But it doesn't affect your character. It doesn't affect your, what kind of person you are at all. There's no differences between people. Differences are imported, and they're all, well, I'll get to the second point later, but they're imported for negative reasons. As I mentioned, this is our country's besetting sin, even in the church. Some of our heroes in church history, I'm thinking of George Whitfield here, have got this horribly wrong even lobbying for slavery and for, for institutionalized racism. Not all of them, though. It was Spurgeon who wrote or preached this in a sermon, quote, there's no God in heaven if the iniquity of slavery goes unpunished. There's no God existing in heaven above if the cry of the Negro does not bring down a hail of red blood upon the nation that holds slaves. And obviously, the story of racism in the United States is, I don't know, complicated would be one word. But it's worth noting real quick that it's based upon a lie that there is distinguishing characteristics inside of a person that you can see from the outside. I mean, there's evangelical schools. I'm harping on this just because you don't think like I'm preaching against sins that were around 200 years ago. There are evangelical, in quote, schools that banned interracial dating and marriage until 20 years ago. This is not an old school problem. This is a present tense problem. And buying into that mindset that the races shouldn't mingle or that they shouldn't marry or they should be categorized differently, it's buying into an evolutionary lie. It undercuts our unity in Adam. It undercuts our unity in Christ. It undercuts basic biblical anthropology. And it undercuts, it destroys the fabric that builds the church. And it's not just about race, of course. We think that a general coming to faith is more significant than a major getting saved or a senator coming to church is more significant than a janitor. I think of the story in Matthew 20 where Jesus tells a story about the landowner who goes to pick up some vineyard workers for the day and he hires some at nine in the morning. He hires more at noon. He hires more at three. At five o'clock, he goes back and there's still people hanging out in the Home Depot parking lot. And you remember what he asked them in Matthew 20? He says, why aren't you working? And their response is, well, nobody hired us. <laughs> And so he says, all right, I'll hire you. Hop on in. And they go and they work for, you know, a half hour. And the owner pays everybody out, starting with the ones he just hired. Pays them and then pays the ones he hired at noon. And, and the guys who are in the morning are like, well, they got paid what I was going to get paid. And, and the guys who were hired in the morning get exactly the same as everybody else was paid. And, and in their best six-year-old voice, they say, that's not fair. fair. And you know what the landowner says? What do you mean it's not fair? I told you I was going to pay you that. And they're like, yeah, but these guys worked 30 minutes and we worked all day long. We deserve more than you told us. Now listen, you hear that story and I know your heart. You are thinking of yourself as the person that was hired in the morning, aren't you? <laughs> That's not who you are in this story. Understand that you're the one that was hired at the end of the day. I mean, Jesus is telling that story to the Pharisees to explain to them the kingdom is being taken from them and giving to people that, the, that are being hired by the Lord at closing time. That's you. And now for those guys that got hired at 452 to argue with one another and say, well, this guy got hired at 451, so he should get this. And I got hired at 452, so I'm here. And this guy got hired at 453, so he should be over there. I mean, what are you even talking about? There's no difference between you. First, you're not a good judge because you aren't any different from one another. Second, you're not a good judge because you are evil. That's the rest of verse four. You've become, you've made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Why do people make up racial distinctions? There's no biological reality to them at all. Why do people invent them? Well, to oppress other people. That's where it comes from. 
This idea that if you can categorize people, that gives you more power. And that's certainly noteworthy, that not just in issues of race, but also in issues of economics, you always discern the world in a way that puts you at top. (laughs) Somebody who makes less money than you, oh, they're so poor, I don't know how they get by. Somebody who makes more money than you, oh, they're so wealthy. You're Goldilocks, you've got this world figured out just right. It doesn't mean you wouldn't take a raise if it was offered, but you're pretty happy with yourself. Ditto with racial issues. Oh, you've, you've figured it out. You're just right. No. James says you are doing this with evil thoughts or evil motives. There's a wicked motivation behind the categorization of humans into categories. It's not just because you're an unfaithful judge. It's because you're an evil judge. You have sinful motives. Well, thirdly, you're not, good at, you're not a good judge in this because you don't understand election. The doctrine of election. This is verse five. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen who, those who are poor in the world to be rich and in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who love him? And this is, goes back to James's typical manner here of arguing from election to practical application. In chapter one, he said, you have confidence that God is sovereign over your trials in life because he's chosen you, chapter one, verse 18, of his own will to bring forth the word of truth in you. Here in chapter two, he's saying, don't divide people up into categories because God's the one who brings them to church. If he loved a person enough to save him and put him in the church, why would you categorize him once he's here? God is in charge of the makeup of his church, not you. Your job is to evangelize, not strategize. You're the seed sower. God's the one who gives the growth. It's basic biblical evangelism, but I hope you understand how it affects the doctrine of the church, that God is the one who brings people here. If Jesus loves someone enough to bring him here, then you better receive him also. Or do you have better taste than Jesus? Picture Samuel and Jesse watching all of Jesse's kids and going down the lineup looking for the king. And they didn't even invite David in the room, remember? They go through the list and Samuel's like, well, the king's got to be here somewhere. And they're, Jesse and Samuel are looking at each other. Well, it's not one of these guys. Oh, who can it be? That's what we're like when we start dividing people up. I mean, we don't even see the obvious answer. You can hear the sheep out the window and picture Jesse just closing the blinds, you know? There's a final irony in this verse that God's gonna take the poor and make them look at the middle of verse five, rich in faith. It's not enough for God to simply build his church by saving the poor. He's gonna make them rich, which leads to the fourth point here. First, you're not a good judge because you aren't any different. Secondly, because you're evil. Third, because you don't understand election. Fourth, you're not a good judge because you dishonor those in God's image. That's the first part of verse six. You've dishonored the poor man. That's a sin because the poor man as well is in the image of God. Holding on to racial distinctions or economic distinctions between people, especially when there are no real distinctions, undercuts our unity in Adam, undercuts our unity in Jesus, and brings shame upon the image of God. I have a bunch of quotes in my notes from some scientists saying that there is no such category as race, despite all their efforts to come up with one. You can listen to the Genesis 9 sermon to hear more about that. But let me give you this quote from Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let them, plural, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, livestock, and over everything that creeps in the earth. So God created man in his own image. That's true of every human being, without exception. That one fact means you have more in common with any other human than anything could ever distinguish you. The image of God means you have the capacity to rule the earth. Fish don't put up fences. You have the capacity to produce life. There's Trinitarian implications in this, that the uh, Father and the Son together, the, from which the Spirit proceeds. It takes one plus two to produce the third. That's certainly what's meant in Genesis 1, 26. There's way more I'd like to say about that, but time gets away from us capacity to worship. You're in the image of God, which gives you the capacity to reflect God's glory back to him. You're the mirror that reflects like to like. All of that means the poorest person from a different culture or different ethnic group, you have more in common with him of your brothers and sisters in Christ than you do with anybody else in the world. Fifthly, you're not a good judge because you get your judgments wrong. Because you're wrong anyway. That's the second part of verse six. 
Are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? And then verse seven, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you're called? In other words, James is saying, look, don't make distinctions among yourselves. But since you're doing it, let me point something out to you. You're doing it wrong. You're really, you shouldn't be overseeing this court case anyway, but now that you've put the robe on yourself and you've got your gavel in your hand, do you realize you're always ruling for the wrong side? The, poor, the rich person comes in, he's ushered to the front with pomp and circumstance, and James says, let me just point something out to you. You recognize that it's the rich people that didn't want to see their power taken away, and so they crucified Jesus Christ. You recognize it's the rich people that keep dragging you into court. They're suing you all the time. The poor person's not suing you. He's not taking things from you. It's the rich person who's doing that. Now, James isn't advocating communism or socialism or anything like that here. Remember, this is coming from the standpoint of stop dividing people up. But he's pointing out to you, if you're going to start showing honor to one person over the other, why don't you flip it? After all, it's not the, the poor person that keeps suing you, he's saying. Hath not God chosen the poor and selected them as monuments of his love for his glory? to make them rich in faith. Think of Luke 16, 25, the parable of Abraham and the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus is in heaven and the, the rich man is suffering in hell and he cries out to Abraham. Abraham responds to him and says, child, remember, this is Luke 16, 25, that you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus in like manner received bad things, but now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. The implication that God has chosen the poor not to have a little faith, it's not the poor are lucky they got saved so they can sit in the back row. He's chosen the poor to be rich in faith. That this in the church is one place where the poor and the underprivileged by society's standards have equal access to the Lord and the Savior. In fact, they have an advantage because how much is the gospel glorified through their conversion? You think, oh, how sweet would it be if the powerful rich politician gets saved? Think of how he could influence people. Ha! Flip that around. How about somebody who's on the short end of the stick in every area of life that knows what poverty is, that knows what suffering is? If that person can still get to a place where they trust the Lord of heaven, the Lord of their poverty, the Lord of their affliction, and they get saved, I mean, that is a conversion. It's a miracle when anybody gets saved, but I mean, that's a real miracle, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's James's point. Verse seven, the rich are the ones that are blaspheming the honorable name by which you recall. I think he's referencing the crucifixion of Christ there. Think of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being can boast in his sight. I mean, we're so tempted to think of heaven and the rich, powerful people on the earth. They certainly have front row seats in heaven, right? And the poor people on earth that get saved, they'll just be lucky to be there. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story about a rich man and a guy named Lazarus. The dogs licked him, you know. Again, it's impossible for a poor person to get saved. It's impossible for a rich person to get saved. They're both impossible. Needle, camel, eye, they don't fit. But with God, all things are possible. So look at who he saves. The early complaint against Christianity was it was religion for the poor. Paul took that as a compliment. Number six, you're not a good judge because you yourself are convicted by the law. Verse 9, if you show partiality, you're committing sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. <laughs> if you show up for a court case, you know, a traffic ticket or whatever kind of court case you're in and you walk in and the, the judge is being led out by handcuffs, something went wrong. <laughs> That's James's point here. Listen, you want to know the final reason you're not a good judge of this? Because you're the one who keeps getting convicted by the law. You're the guilty one here. It's you who deserves to go to jail. It's you that deserves God's judgment. We'll talk more about that next week. Just in conclusion, though, James ends in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. By the royal law, he's just elevating that ethical mandate above all of the law. This is not new for James. Jesus said that, love your neighbors yourself to the rich young ruler who asked what it took to be saved. 
Matthew 22, Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord. The second is to love your neighbor. Romans 13, don't criticize James for saying this commandment's more important than the rest because Paul does it in Romans 13, in the, verse nine, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Any other command are summed up with this, love your neighbor as yourself. You don't need a book on racial reconciliation. You don't need six steps to recognize racism in your heart. What you need to do is love your neighbor as yourself. It's true that in much of our country's evangelical history, evangelicals and Presbyterians and Baptists actively taught that these commands did not apply to those of a different race. Love your neighbor meant those that God categorized you into racial categories, so love your neighbor meant only love those that you live next to that are of your same race. This makes you sound more like the rich young ruler or the lawyer who says, hey, who is my neighbor after all? We've got around that now in our culture where we just live next to people that make the same amount of money we do. So we have no problem loving our neighbor until some new family moves in or maybe four families into one house. You think, what are they doing here? They don't belong in this neighborhood. They're not my real neighbor. The solution to being an evil and wicked judge is to love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, verse one, very unusual phrase. My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. You can't categorize some people in a different category saying this person has more glory than someone else because all glory belongs to Jesus. The point is make yourself low. See others as just beggars to receive grace. We're all poor reflections of the only human who's in a category by himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Lord, we recognize that much of this is, is law. We're condemned by this. Even the command to love your neighbors yourself, we fall far short of that. That you've responded by giving us gospel. The Lord of glory has come to us to offer us forgiveness for sins and to receive us with open arms. We may discriminate, but he does not. He shows no partiality with God. There is no playing favorites. For those who are believers, Lord, we pray that you, we would reflect that more and more, that we would grow in reflecting your image to the world. For those who are here today that aren't believers, I pray that they would see the truth of Jesus Christ, who harbors no sin, yet who died for sinners, and they'd be drawn to him. The true Adam, the true man, God in human flesh, who opens his arms for us who believe. We give you thanks for him in Jesus' name. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.